Well, hello there, and thank you for tuning in to yet another week of What's the Juice podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to the wonderful, the sweet, the spiritual, the intelligent, the fierce Lauren Baca. She is a nutritional therapy practitioner and an herbalist. And I know that there is a subset of humans out there who loves the herbal episodes. And this is one that you are just going to eat up. It's going to go right to your heart because Lauren and I talk so much about herbal medicine and the different ways that you can use it that go beyond just putting a bunch of plant matter into a tincture. Lauren and I are going to really talk about the almost forgotten, more subtle framework of true traditional herbalism and how it's about treating the person in front of you and their actual personality, their actual patterns, their coherence or lack thereof, rather than just treating their condition and slapping some herbs on them for a certain condition or diagnosis that they have. It's this old world way of using herbalism to match plants to a person who needs a certain spirit. You know, sometimes you need a little spicy spirit of Damiana to remind you that life is meant to be enjoyed and that you can be a little bit more in touch with your spicy feminine side and let things roll off your shoulders a little bit more and that it's okay to have fun. You know, plants are alive and have spirits too. And that is so much of what herbalism is about and what we talk about in this episode. So very fun. We're going to chat about reconnecting these kindred spirits, reconnecting us as humans to the plants that we evolved with that know how to get to those deepest blocks that we have on a soul level that are preventing us from healing. We're also going to talk about bioenergetic testing and how it's a totally different kind of testing versus just taking blood and looking at labs, but it's actually scanning and reading the energy of a person and what herbs and plants and flower essences and homeopathic remedies that act on a more energetic level may be a match to where a person is lacking or needing support. And Lauren is going to kind of talk about this not actually new, but older paradigm once again of herbalism where you don't always need to use heroic doses of plant medicine and tinctures in order to have an actual effect on the body. So. For example, rather than taking a full dosage of a tincture, like a few full droppers, she has seen a lot of her clients have even more successful results with something that we call in the herb world spirit doses or drop doses, where you're just taking a single drop of a tincture. And we kind of talk about the lens and the theory of homeopathy and why more diluted or energetic essence doses of plants can be even more suited to the conditions that we're struggling with versus trying to push the body with a ton of phytochemicals, even though sometimes, of course, that's necessary. So it's just a really interesting combo on the different ways in which one can engage with holistic medicine and herbalism. And she's just so connected and so educational. And I learned so much from her in this episode. And it was really nice to delve into this world and get a little spiritual. So I hope you guys love this episode. Thanks for listening as always and for being here with me. Okay, are you ready? You know, we feel each other's emotions. It's everything. It's living my life intentionally. That's the message, right? Absolutely. There's no difference between our mental health and our physical health. It's the same exact thing. And without further ado, let's get juicy. Miss Lauren Baca, it is so lovely to have you here in person on What's the Juice podcast. Wow, I it's incredible to be here. I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm so happy to talk to your community. And I know there's some lovely people here just getting so much value from what you do. So just thank you for what you do. It is really not me. The podcast moves through me. It's like it, it'll tell me this person <laughs> next or like I just have a draw and it's really you. It's the guests that are that make it so special and, and what you have to share. So thank you for coming on. Thank you. Can you explain to us a little bit about the practice of herbalism itself in terms of how we herbalists are taught to treat the person in front of us and not the condition mm -hmm. and how our goal is to sort of be a matchmaker between the personality of the human and the soul of the plant, kind of reconnecting these kindred spirits mm -hmm. instead of 
the allopathic version of herbalism, which can kind of be like matching a phytochemical to a disease? Beautiful question. I think it's a really good place to start. <laughs> so I will say when I, you know, over a decade ago, when I was first learning and just diving into the world of herbalism, I learned through that phytochemical rich template, which has such a place, especially when we're doing acute treatments. Um, but I once had a teacher, she's now passed. Um, she was a Loney elder. And she said to me something that at that time that she told me, I didn't know how to grasp it. But she said, the most powerful medicine can come in the smallest dosage. And I was like, what the heck is she saying? <laughs> like, what? We need the milligrams. We need, you know, we need all of that to have actual effect. So when I actually started working with people through the template of herbalism, I found that there was such a fracture when we just looked at the person and said, oh, this person has gallbladder stagnation. We have to give them some beautiful bitters, right? Some some um, gentian root, like what whatever would get that stagnancy moving. But we didn't actually create a portrait of what that human's entire experience was at that time. And because I know you've studied some of the traditional Chinese mm -hmm. philosophies, like we, our whole, the way that our body works is not just a physiological process. There is such a connection between our emotions, right? There's the study of psychoneuroimmunology, the way that we actually perceive our environment, perceive ourselves, the way we are thinking and experiencing actually changes proteins, which go ahead and then alter the functionality of every system in our body. So when we're looking at someone, when you said the to treating the totality of the human, it's like, what are you experiencing right now? Are you in a phase of grief? Are you in a phase of um, anger, unexpressed anger, right? Like all those things really matter when we're treating the person. And I always want to emphasize that it's the portrait of the whole entire being in front of you, not just what their test results say, what their symptoms say. Those are important, but they're only a percentage of what's actually happening inside that human. Hmm. I want to know this about you because I actually have no idea this story. How did you get into herbalism and how did you find the elders and the teachers that you learned from? You know, everything in my life feels very serendipitous. I, When I was growing up, I grew up in the um, California Bay Area with a wonderful set of grandparents. And, you know, I, I saw very quickly that their health, you know, they were on multiple medications, had, you know, there was a lot of strokes and heart attacks in my family. And I had this curiosity from a very young age of like, how can I have that not happen <laughs> to myself, but also my future family and just creating something, um, a, a different picture for my life. Mm -hmm. And so I was really interested in all different modalities from a very young age. And I would, you know, like go outside in the garden and pick my grandma's roses that because she had a big, beautiful rose garden. And I didn't know I was like practicing herbalism at the time. I would like make rose tea and I'd be like, mm, this is so lovely and make rosemary tea. And uh, those are two plants that I just was like fascinated with because they were in my garden. But it wasn't until um, I had kind of gone the nutrition route first. And then I decided, you know what, like this still feels like nutrition's a lovely foundation. Oh yeah. I love my functional dietitian. Right? Oh gosh. We love it. And I went to school for dietetics, but it's like at the end of the day, I was like, this isn't, this isn't it for me. No, it needs to go a lot deeper. It needs to go a lot deeper. And so, um, I ended up working at a little, um, herbal apothecary in Berkeley, California. And, you know, at that time, I just happened to come across a lot of people who would come in there, uh, teachers, you know, I ended up diving into, courses. And that's how I found myself here. But it wasn't even people in the courses who taught me the most. I think a lot of the courses at that time, remember this was like a decade ago, mm -hmm. were still very functional. Um, it was really going to ceremonies and communicating with just teachers that you wouldn't even know about on, mm -hmm. you know, social media or something like that. Yeah. Literally the people who are like really out here. Yeah. The time They're tonight. like, I don't care about <laughs> being out there, I just want to like come teach and then go back into the forest, right? Those are the people that really influenced me the most. So that's how I got into herbalism and how I started to actually think of herbalism in this different branch of, you know, like traditional herbalism mm -hmm. versus this more vibrational quantum perspective of plant medicine. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of more what you're doing now, which we're going to get into. Yeah. How would you 
perhaps define what traditional herbalism is. And when you were going down that path of learning the Materia Medica and going one by one, learning a plant for, yes, it's phytochemicals and it's actions and studies, but also it's spirit and it's story and it's folklore among different cultures. Um, did you have perhaps any plants that first spoke to you or that you were first in relationship with? Because I find a lot of herbalists do. I love that question. I And I know from just watching your stories and being in connection with you for years that you've dreamed about plants, right? That's how plants have come to me as well. And I think when I was studying in the Materia, Materia Medica, it's like, to me, honestly, I was, I loved it, but I was also bored with it in some capacity. And just for those listening, Materia Medica is when you're in herb school, you have to essentially learn like the plants A to Z. So mm -hmm. it's like one class you're going to be learning about chamomile and mm -hmm. that's Materia Medica that day. It's like the encyclopedia of herbs yep. kind of. And your teacher is going to go through the energetics, the taste, the dosage, the forms in which it's best consumed, the history of it, all of these things. And every herbalist has their own Materia Medica, right? Like this is something that many herbalists like create over a lifetime too. And it changes with their relationship with plants. So I I love reading other herbalists Materia Medica because it's like, wow, that that potency came through that human having that experience with that plant. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we study, goes, going back to your first question, when we study plants in isolation, um, it doesn't allow for us to understand the interactions that specific humans have with the plants, which teach us so much. And that goes back to your question of like, what is traditional herbalism? Like, that is such a big question. Mm -hmm. I think when we think about traditional herbalism in the United States, a lot of us think of like the eclectic herbalists who came over from Europe and it was very, it was very clinical based. Mm -hmm. um, but herbalism, you know, I've, I've traveled a lot and spoken to a lot of healers and beautiful people who work with plants. And one of the things is plants are first and foremost an entity to be interacted with. And I think that that is something that I'm not saying it wasn't present in eclectic herbalism. But it's something that really didn't funnel through in a potent way. Because perhaps eclectic herbalism then was brought here and like almost commercialized and needed to be taught to so many people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's part of it? I think so. I think that – I think back, you know, a couple hundred years ago when there was herbalism and homeopathy coming over from, you know, Europe, we were really trying – I mean, I'm just thinking about the landscape of the time, right? There was – cholera. There was like a lot of chronic, not chronic, I will say a lot of acute disease mm -hmm. going on. And it's like, how can we get medicine to the people and treat people or and train doctors, mm -hmm. right, to be able to address these things? There really wasn't a time, and I'm just stipulating here, there really wasn't time to go into like maybe that depth. Yeah. And then by the time that herbalism had to be kind of, you know, Flexner report came along, a lot of these modalities got kind of pushed down and suppressed it kind of stayed there with where they were. You know, they they brought all of this phytochemical nutri uh, nutritional information with the plants and how to treat disease, yeah. but it wasn't yet allowed to go that deep. And I think that's where we're all as herbalists trying to go back to. Mm -hmm. And that's where we learn from our elders. And that's where we, you know, go back into our ancestry and how, do, how were plants respected? How were they actually uh, intervened with before they were used and stripped and decided to be like, this is for me. Mm. The word use comes up for me a lot because even in my own language, I'm like, you can use this herb for X, Y, Z. And I don't even realize how much my language is, uh, you know, discounting the spirit of that plant. And like, it's, I almost wanted to say, humanness. I fall into that too. <laughs> I mean, we all do. And it's, especially when you're communicating it on a public platform to help people understand how to use again, a plant in a tincture or a tea. Yeah. It's like this language kind of gets woven in and even the practice of it gets a little bit allopathicized. That's not a word, but you're right. When the, when the European eclectic herbalist came over and I think about like Nicholas Culpepper, mm -hmm. a lot of it was like this herb for fevers. Like yes. it was very acute dysentery. Like it was just for very specific situations. Not that they didn't have they that They were building hospitals, wisdom. you know, like they were treating very sick people. Yes. Because again, herbalism is the original medicine. And mm -hmm. not to say that we had it perfected back then either. A lot of people died of dysentery. A lot of people died of a bunch of diseases, but also these herbs were effective for them as well for some folks. Um, but it wasn't essentially standardized. And then also the pitfalls that the more you standardize it, kind of the more diluted and yeah. weirder it gets. So that is also where I 
I think like you look to the ancient traditions and cultures, look to Ayurveda, look to, to traditional Chinese medicine, look to um, ancient Mayan medicine, you know, mm-hmm. like the the Native American element wheel, mm-hmm. um, or I'm sorry, not the element wheel, the, the four directions. The four directions, yeah. The four directions, the Chinese medicine element wheel, the Native American Mayan medicine four directions. And so you look at the way that these cultures revered the plant spirits and the energetic and emotional and spiritual aspect of not just the plants, but of disease as well. And you have to see the whole person, you know, because they're seeing and witnessing the whole plant and how it acts on all of our different bodies, energetic body, emotional body, physical body. But obviously that doesn't translate to science. And that's where a lot of people will say, well, you're an herbalist. What even is that? And yeah, it's like, what even is that? Because we don't have a licensure or um, a specific guideline or board that we necessarily have to follow unless, you know, you're going through the American Herbalist Guild. And even that, it's not quite as rigorous as a dietetics board or anything. But it's also the fact that the nature of herbalism is to be a little bit (laughs) anti-system is to have every herbalist make their own materia medica and yes learn from the elders put those basic indications of chamomile but then also have our own experience with chamomile within ourselves and our community and be able to weave that in and consistently grow in relationship with the plants just like we grow in a relationship with a friend and learn more about them Mm -hmm. as we Mm -hmm. grow and change Mm -hmm. it truly is a relationship and i think that when It sounds so silly, but when I am picking medicine, you know, I don't just decide today I'm going to pick this plant. It's I sit with this plant. I have a moment with this plant and I feel if it if that medicine is is needing to be transmuted through me. Right. It's it's like such an honor to be able to enter. Plants are sentient beings. Mm -hmm. Right. They are they are in the web of biology just like us. So there's feeling, there's, there's emotion, there's protons, electrons, like all of these, like we are swimming in this soup of an interaction with a plant. And so going back to what I was saying before, like herbal, like to have a relationship with a plant is, is not just to make a tincture and just, you know, dose it every day. It's, it starts when you are thinking about picking the medicine. It starts when you are in your backyard or your, you know, or the farm or wherever you are sourcing medicine and saying like, okay, is this the right time to u- to utilize this? And I think that there's, as herbalists, like we have our eye on plants that are continuously becoming endangered. And this, what I, what I was saying, right, with that elder who told me like some of the most potent medicine comes in the smallest dosage. I think that higher dosages Mm -hmm. in the times of the eclectic herbalists, higher dosages are great for acute issues. Really get a flu, great. You know, like on the tail end, use some, you know, you can use tons of things. But one of the things that I'm saying is we're in this phase of polysystemic conditions. We are not in acute treatment phase as a society. Mm -hmm. We're more on this chronic suppressed, um, we're working at the chronic suppressed physiology state and medicine i think needs to change the way that we actually dose herbs i find it's so much more potent when we're working with smaller dosages with spirit medicine because the body is so confused in, in a lot of people right I, I see in my clinic i treat not i don't want to say treat in my clinic <laughs> i support lots of chronic condition cases right yeah you look at these symptom burdens and you're like, wow, there's literally 300 different types of symptoms this one client is having. How do we tweeze that apart, right? How do we pick? How do you fit it in a syndrome? Yeah. How do you fit it in even, you know, if their doctor were to give them a diagnosis, that often doesn't even cover the range of symptoms that people are now experiencing Mm -hmm. due to chronic dis-ease. Chronic dis-ease. It's, there's so many things at play here. So that's why I think that Mother Nature is kind of requesting us to shift the way that we use plants, not only because nature itself is struggling, but because we are struggling too. There's an interconnection with how we need to communicate with with the medicine. Mm. You said what we're dealing with now, instead of, again, the age of um, cholera and dysentery, where it was these acute bacterial, viral, like... Mm -hmm 
infections that were taking the lives of most people. We're now living a lot longer because we have those illnesses covered and figured out. Thank goodness. Right. It's yeah. As herbalists, we love Western medicine. It's like such a, it's can often become conflated where folks will think that it's like, we're just holistic, but what you're saying is quite literally when you're dealing with anything like that, anything that's acute where you need a stronger dose of something, or you need a, a modern medicine that's proven to work and save a life. Absolutely. Yeah. That's where we want you to go. But when we're dealing with these chronic illnesses that often stem from um, not just a physical, but also an emotional and spiritual root, there's also a medicine for that. Mm -hmm. And it's our oldest medicine. And perhaps often even the ultimate root of those things is disconnection period. And thus even just the practice and spirit of true herbalism or just plant relationship as a whole can help to heal that root of disconnection by reconnecting us. And I really believe that if folks can reconnect with themselves and with those around them and with their environment and with their families in a way where we truly witness each other, mm -hmm. not in this way where we've been in codependent relationship for so long, um, not only in human relationship, but even just in our relationship in our economy, the way that other countries are codependent on the US dollar, like our whole world is codependency, disconnection, wrong relationship right now. Mm -hmm. I think that's the root of really what we're experiencing. And so if we can uh, reinstate our connection to one another and the natural world and the plants and become conscious in the way that we live and the way that we think about what would be best right now? Should I pick that? Should I not? Should I make sure that I'm not making a mess over here and making too much garbage? Should I make sure that I'm considering this other person's feelings instead of taking up all this space? Like, if we just get into right relationship, I think that <laughs> is the road to healing. That, what you just said is that that is the portrait of our current time. We are disassociated from mm -hmm. self, from our ecology, from the soma, right? From our experience of being in this body. Ooh. Yeah, it, and there is absolutely no way to heal if, if we are so fractured in that capacity because the way that we seek out healing is very materialistic. Yes. It's, I have so this disease, mm -hmm. how can I take something? How can I add to the picture? When at the end of the day, these polysystemic conditions are, like I said, so muddled and confused internally that adding more, sometimes anything you put into your body is information. Your body has to assimilate that in some capacity. So when I see clients with 20 supplements, how, what is the ability of their body to actually utilize that, transmute that, and send the information from those supplements to the direct organs that need to be supported, mm -hmm. right? It's actually very, very little, yeah. you know, I believe. That's what I, that's what I see at least. And so, you know, the people that I do a lot of mentorship and when I'm talking to practitioners, I say all the time, less is more less is more. And whether that's about how we interact with plant medicine or how we just think about not adding to our plate, we need to subtract. We have too much in our mind. We have too much on our hearts. And with all of that, we're even suppressing and ignoring all of our basic needs, the needs of our family, the needs of our world. We can't heal from that place. And so my goal is to First, help us reconnect with ourselves so that we can even become aware, right? When you start working with plants, your perception blows open. First, you feel that internally, mm -hmm. but as you kind of clear this confusion inside, you start to be able to perceive what's actually happening outside of you. Um, it's kind of this like this level of hierarchy that happens, right? You, The basic body, this, this vehicle, this flesh vehicle that we live in, is one in which we get, we have the blessing of being able to meet ourselves in it, our higher self, our spirit, yeah. God, whatever you want to call it, yeah. right? And then once we do that, we can get up the ladder to this more bio-eco social understanding of, of living mm -hmm. and being. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking a lot about how we are stuck in this mode of like consume and compare as a society. And like, that's a, I'm, we're bringing it back to these things because I think we're trying to sort of get to 
this like root cause of why we're all so ill. Cause I, I had this that word root cause so yeah. much to unpack there. Yeah. Cause it's like, Oh, well your, our, your root cause is SIBO. It's like, okay, but is it, or is it like also this like spiritual? Like it's, yeah. It, there's so many, yeah. Root causes that we think are our root cause, but often the root cause is so much deeper. Um, and every time you think you get to a root cause, you find a deeper one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had an episode with Zach Bush and he said, it's very telling that the richer we get, the sicker we get, yeah. that you, even the richest people in the world can't buy themselves out of chronic illness. And mm-hmm. in fact, are some of the sickest and are going to the most expensive functional doctors and this and that, and are still unwell. So it's money is not going to get us out of this and consuming and getting the best of the best. And in fact, it is actually a symptom and a root issue. And I find that we are often consuming because we are thinking that we will find the solutions to this very deep sense of disconnection from ourselves, the earth and each other through the next best thing, right? Like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'll just buy that thing that they told me I'm lacking and then I'll feel better. And it never works, right? So we just keep consuming more and we're comparing, right? We're, We're judging. A lot of us walk around and and I say this because it's something I've been working very hard to become aware of and shift in myself. But a lot of us walk around and have this internal voice of judgment. And we look at others to, we judge them because we are constantly comparing ourselves to them, or we're trying to find that again, external person as a point to which we can understand ourselves because we have no understanding Mm. of ourselves and no connection to ourselves. And once you start to build a relationship with yourself, start there, rebuild that, and then eventually build deeper relationships with others and with nature, which I think is the ultimate solution to all of this in many ways, um, then you notice that you don't judge and compare as much and you can just see. Yes. And just seeing and witnessing is the answer. It's just, it's simple, but it's not simple to get there. It's so hard to get there when you're used to judging, comparing, consuming, and and lacking. Mm-hmm. You so beautifully said that. And I really paint my life as being a series of very intense deaths. Yes. Very intense deaths that, and th- that's, I share some of that sometimes, but a lot of that's very personal to me. And the way in which I've moved through that is to go into a void of myself is to allow silence with myself. Because what happens so much of the time is that one, if we don't have a connection to ourself and then we're experiencing something very tragic or just some transformation that we need to go through, disassociation is the first route, whether that is social media, porn, video, like whatever it is, right? Shopping, it it can be in so many different fashions. We have these ritualistic behaviors that we build because at the end of the day, we want to be rooted and grounded in some type of ritual, whether it's something seeking outside of ourselves is at least going to give us some type of hit for that. Um, But it's a, it's a, it's a false type of, of rooting. And I think that when we're Going back to the fractured society, judging others, um, having these preconceived ideas of what others have and what we don't, that is only natural if we don't have healthy connections and communities. And guess what? We don't have that. Yeah. Every single person I talk to, what do you do? Like, what do you like besides focusing on what's going wrong? What does your community mm. look like? How do you spend your, how do you have fun? Mm. Who are the people that you center yourself with? What does your family life look like? Do you have family? Are you separated from your family? You know, I think loneliness, sure. isolation, yeah, number one root cause if we want to use that word. And I, when you were saying root cause, the reason I said there's so much weight around that is because there's this, and I don't, I can't take credit for this. Chris Cresser had an amazing, um, it was a couple years back, an amazing newsletter that a friend sent to me. And she was like, look, this is exactly like what you talk about, Lauren, like root cause versus root causism, you know, science versus scientism. It's the same idea. It's like this root causism is that there's one reason for this one problem. And guess what? 
we monopolize the heck out of that, right? Like we sell things to treat this root cause. Even a lot of practitioners are like, I, I am a root cause practitioner. I do, you know, this parasites are your one reason that everything is wrong. Yes. And yeah. I've moved so much away from using that word because while I think there's, these people are doing great things, I keep coming back to polysystemic. There is no single root cause. It's a cacophony of different imbalances that we're dealing with from physical things, but having deeper roots into the psycho-emotional world too. You used the term before, I think, suppressed mm. physiology. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it in relation to how we are being asked to intake so much at all times, whether that's 20 supplements or that's um, a podcast or music or a TV show playing in the background while we're doing everything, while we're brushing our teeth, never having a moment of silence, constantly consuming images, advertisements, noise, pollution. Uh, we're just constantly having these inputs. Um, what do you mean by suppressed physiology? How does it relate to that? And what else does it entail? This is a really deep question and it's something that is really important because because it goes back to body confusion. So suppression is an idea that I learned when I first started studying homeopathy. In homeopathy, there's this idea that somebody who is in a suppressed state has gotten there by ignoring symptomology, trying to address symptomology through pharmaceuticals. Say, for example, I see a lot of kids who come in with chronic strep infections, right? Tonsils taken out. And they've been on, you know, by the time that they're five, six, they've been on five or six rounds of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And what happens to a body when you are continually providing it something to do a job that it's supposed to be entrained to be able to do? So our immune system is like a muscle, right? The more that we allow it to flex, the stronger our ability to immune modulate. So with all of the rounds of antibiotics that most people take with all of these suppressive medicines, NyQuil, DayQuil, you know, Terraflu, whatever, for when you get sick, our ability to immune modulate now has just steadily declined. And so when you become an adult and you have, gosh, chronic IBS, chronic psoriasis, people are now trying to treat that without thinking about that. What you were seeing on the outside is a reflection of your tr your body trying to actually move through a confused state because of all of these years of just silencing mm -hmm. something that it needed to learn how to do on its own. So suppression is very common in chronic conditions. The flip side of that though, is that when you support someone through chronic conditions, they're going to go through a regression phase. Sometimes we in functional medicine terms, sometimes call this a Herx reaction and people are very scared of it. They're like, I don't want to feel bad, especially when you felt bad for a long time. Mm -hmm. But your body has to retrain itself to go through what it needed to go through to finally find what we call this balance of the vital force. In Chinese traditional medicine, we call this qi, right? Mm -hmm. For energy to be able to actually circulate throughout the body and send the proper messages mm -hmm. and help us immune modulate and just help us keep our vitality. Yeah. So suppression, I mean, you and I have probably suppressed things many times in our lives, right? Well, I was going to ask, I mean, when it comes to, I took so many antibiotics as a kid. And when I hear that with the recurring strep, I guess it's like a part of me wants to push back in a sense and, and say, well, what's the alternative? Because you're a mom who has a kid with strep and strep is dangerous. And yeah. obviously you're going to give the antibiotic. You, yeah. you don't really have any other choice. I mean, obviously you can use herbs with a right practitioner, but for the most part, most people aren't educated so to know any other option. Exactly. Yes. And it also, since strep can be so systemic, it's often safer, right? In that time to use an antibiotic, it's the better option. Yeah. So what, yeah, it's kind of like, what do we do there? Like, is it that the terrain is so stressed from birth because of our modern world that that's why we're more prone to the strep or like, what would be the solution there? <laughs> yeah. Great question. You use the word terrain, mm -hmm. right? Terrain is a really big word to kind of think about this, this total milieu and how it's, um, for lack of better words, able to combat things that are coming into it, right? If we have a junked up terrain, if we have lots of biotoxicity, it's going to be harder for our bodies to fight off 
infections of any kind. Now, the thing is, and this goes back to kind of the traditional Chinese medicine idea of like kidney jing. When we're talking about suppression, we're in a really tricky spot, no doubt, because it doesn't just start with us. I mean, my mother was on severe antipsychotic medication, you know, while she was pregnant with me, mm -hmm. her mother, right? Like there, th this is a, we have now lived in multi-generations where people have just been living on pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. How does that change the energetic milieu, the energetic terrain? And how does it rob of our internal kind of vital force or, or kidney jing, right? That we actually give down the line to our next of kin. So, and for people listening, like I, it can feel really horrible to hear like, oh yeah, I've given my kid lots of antibiotics. Am I doing this to them? It's like, you're doing what the only thing that you know how to do. Yeah. We're just in a tricky place mm -hmm. where we're trying to work back from that. And we're, we're a generation who's, there's a lot of people doing really great work here. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the end of the day, it's one round of antibiotics isn't going to end the world for someone, but we need to recognize if a child needs seven, eight rounds of antibiotics, and then we remove tissue that is our first line of defense, right? Like that, those, um, having our tonsils removed, that's a lymphoid tissue. That's a signaling tissue. Mm -hmm. So it just, it's a big problem that we're, we're having right yeah. now. I don't know if I have the answer to what's the other alternative, right? I can't necessarily tell someone that because then they're going to go and try to treat this naturally and not have professional support. Mm -hmm. And that could be very dangerous. Yeah. And then I think back to four generations ago, a lot of kids did die of yes. things like even when we had herbalism mm -hmm. around, right? So it's, we're actually so lucky to be living in a time where we have these Western tools that work so well that we can totally prolong our lives and take a simple antibiotic to prevent a death that shouldn't happen from strep. And at the same time, how do we balance our like true respect and reverence for how powerful those tools are yeah. and like kind of how careful we need to be with them with also learning what our bodies really need on this base level now that we're in a time where we can have both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's about melding the two and being able to have people just understand, like you said, the the power. Yeah. When there's power, there has to be discernment. Yeah. There's really great doctors out there, but it's also, there's a ton of doctors who are just over-prescribing mm -hmm. antibiotics. And one of the, I mean, gosh, there was an article that came out. One of the biggest problems that we are going to face and we are already facing is mega pathology because of the overuse of these antibiotics. One day they might not work anymore. What are we going to do? So we have to start thinking about different alternatives. And that's where we don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I want a community of practitioners to be able to come together and talk through what the world is really going through so that we can try to find and provide a type of medicine, a type of support that can start to alleviate that burden yes. because it's only going to get worse. And that burden falls on mothers the most, Huge you way. know, it's the, who are raising beautiful children in a time where, yeah, kids are more chronically ill than ever and are making these decision, decisions each day and are trying to do what's best for their families and are trying to, what do I need to buy organic? What am I going to put my budget towards? It's it's really a wild time that we're living in. I guess no time in history has been calm. It, it always, every every time has their <laughs> thing, you know? Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Okay. So that suppressed physiology, that's really fascinating me. My brain is is ticking there. What else do you mean by suppressed physiology other than just the body not being able to express fully in terms of its immune system because we are overprescribed things like antibiotics, even when we don't need them? Yeah. Um, so let's say we're a kid and we have a, a ear infection that would normally resolve on its own or could be helped with some sort of an ear oil, a garlic yeah, oil garlic, or like mullein oil. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so where we haven't exhausted all the options, but are going right to the antibiotics and thus the immune system is being overridden. And then because of this di disruption of the immune system and the microbiome, we are more prone to then stronger infections that absolutely need antibiotics in the future and it becomes a vicious cycle. So mm -hmm. that part of the suppressed physiology, I totally get. And it sounds like it starts often in childhood for us mm -hmm. as well as intergenerationally. Yeah. What about suppressed physiology in other ways that are not the immune system that are maybe our emotions? Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> So 
Suppressed physiology is interesting because I think when I talk about this, I want it's easier for people to grasp when we talk about the physiology of it. Like I'm, if I'm looking at a client intake form and they tell me they haven't been sick in 10 years, I'm like, hmm, that, is, that, is that really a good response? Is it really good to not be sick in, you know, in a number of, in a decade? Hmm. Because when you get sick, it's once again, a training ground. If you can mount a lovely, strong fever response, your body is actually cleaning junk up. It's a innate um, it's an internal innate process of reorganization. If you're someone who never gets sick, I start thinking, what is, I do life mapping with my clients. Like what is, I want to know when did you start not having or not getting sick? What happened at that time? What was your antibiotic or medication use before that? Like if you're not mounting a fever, there's no way for the body to clean up. Now that's a good way for people to understand uh, as an entry point for mm -hmm. stress or for suppression. But when we talk about the emotional aspects, suppressing emotions is going to actually affect the capacity for your organ systems to actually communicate and regulate with one another. Our fascia, we have this beautiful interconnected web-like collagen matrix that literally encapsulates every part of our body. It kind of keeps things nestled, mm -hmm. right? And it touches everything. It touches into the deep nucleus of the cell, right? It touches everything in our body. When we have an emotion, I was just talking to a client a couple of weeks ago and I use this, um, I've used this reference kind of a lot recently, but I had a client who had a history of um, dealing with an alcoholic parent. Just seeing her in her session, she was like this, mm -hmm. right? She was huddled over. And I often think, how has that emotion changed her physiology, changed the way her body is contorted, changed the way her fascia, because remember our fascia is like helps us move, right? How was that actually change the capacity of her body to optimally function? She, when she would hear her father come home, just his boot footsteps, she would hide under her bed as a child and like this cradle herself. And as an adult, she's still still carrying that, that posture, mm -hmm. right? And when we look at like her bioenergetic scans, which is something I do with my clients, it's all, all her organs are, are suppressed through this emotion of fear, right? Fear, hiding, like the actual conductivity of those organs are lacking capacity because of this all sensing fascia that has been trained to capsulate itself and live in this chronic fear response. Hmm. It's a really interesting thing to see. And I think, you know, when we, maybe people who hear the word fascia, they've heard of fascia through fascial manipulations, mm -hmm. right? Like, like a myofascial release mm -hmm. or some kind of like fascial massage sort of thing. Yeah. And maybe you've even experienced like getting a fascial release and just like crying your eyes out, right? Like you're like, where did this come from, mm -hmm. right? Our fascia is a sensing organ. And it, when we're babies in the womb, it it's one of the first developing tissues out of our mesoderm. So our fascia is a sensing organ, one of the first that are developed, that is developed in our body. And when we, everything that we come into contact with in this life we're creating kind of a, a memory in our fascia, the way that we interact with, with that emotion. Um, and that then can influence everything else because like I said, the fascia is connected to everything. I could connect this back to the Chinese traditional meridian system where you know emotions and physiology are interconnected and are not really separated, mm -hmm. right? But yeah, suppression of emotions that's kind of the hardest thing in client case taking for me is what what is emotion based and what is physiology based. Mm -hmm. I I don't really think that there's a distinction there. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a bit more about the fascia. I want to get back to herbalism and spirit doses yeah. and small doses in a moment. But because you brought it up, I've been seeing you um, post more about this extracellular matrix which is essentially, is it just the fascia within the... So I would argue that it's not. Okay. Um, is it our connective tissue as a whole? So so the fascia is made of these 
of, of many different types of uh, matrices, the primary one being collagen. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who's been in like a basic A and P course, like you might have done a dissection and like been like, oh, this, you know, your doctor or your professor was like, oh, just remove the fascia, cut it out. It doesn't matter. Just throw it away. Right. You want to get to the underlying structures under the fascia. But the fascia, like I said, contains the whole body. It keeps it in place. And in its basic structure, it is made of what's called these tropocollagen matrices that form a triple helix. We hear of triple helix and we think of DNA. Right. It's it's a it's an ultra conductive medium in our body that's sending signals at all times. And these signals are able to interact with our cells to let our cells know if we're in a state of safety or if we're not in a state of safety. So the cross between the extracellular matrix and the fascia is that they are to me, I kind of bundle them together. Mm -hmm. They together work as this hyperconductive system that allows the cells to understand what's going on. The way that I often teach this is that your cells are swimming in an ocean. That ocean is these this fluid and matrix-like living conductive system that they are surveilling at all times. And it's interesting because from the perspective of cell-mediated receptor science, mm -hmm. like we're looking at the cell, right? How do we target the cell? But the cell is in response to this mm. ocean that it is swimming in. But there's a lot of fascinating uh, information to like read about this. So our fascia, if you look at a picture online of the fascia, you'll see that it actually, it, lo it looks like a beautiful spider web after like a rain. Mm -hmm. It's intertwined with all of this, like it's with this like gel like water. And this water is structured. It's not um, it's not just liquid. It's not solid. It's kind of this in between where it's it's holding the capacity to conduct electricity. Mm -hmm. So when you are when you take a medicine, when you take an herb, your body is actually communicating through the fascia to the rest of the body how that's going to affect everything, how that's making a change to the whole organism of you. Now, that herb might be targeted more towards the liver or more towards the kidneys or more towards, you know, brain health, but your whole body is surveilling that change. And the fascia for me, this is actually where I start supporting clients. The extracellular matrix is where I start supporting clients because if your ocean is polluted, the organisms living inside of your ocean, organisms being cell in this analogy, are not going to be able to respond properly. They're going to get sick too. I mean, look at the reef, you know, the, the coral reefs in our ocean. Mm -hmm. They're only responding to the pollution within that system. So if we continue to just look at the cell-based model, we're I think we're really missing out on the capacity to help the whole system communicate and to realize that cellular based imbalances are only part of the picture here. Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm taking an herb for my liver and I'm wondering why it's not helping or it's getting better temporarily, but then it's coming back. And you're saying it's because that herb has to communicate with the fascia and the extracellular matrix to even get to the liver. And really the extracellular matrix and the fascia are what needs support. So that plant will be digested and some of those phytochemicals will then be shuffled through the blood, which will get to the liver, right? Yeah. But when we're taking a plant, we're not just taking a phytochemical, right? We're also taking that spirit of the plant. We're also taking a kind of a, um, a blueprint mm -hmm. of that plant. And that blueprint is what's going to be communicating, I believe, with our extracellular matrix, with our fascia. You know, the because I work a lot with, I, I've really, really moved away from heavy dosing plant medicine mm -hmm. to more infant, uh, infinitesimal dosing with, I mean, I've worked with flower essences for years, but mm -hmm. now adding in more homeopathy and um, and even like spirit dosing, just regular tinctures too. Yeah. But I find that when we work with that spirit essence of the plant and we don't direct it just to a cell within an organ, mm -hmm. there's this like there's this shift that mm -hmm. the body makes and it starts going into autocorrect itself. And that is what is, a, it's fascinating. So I really think we need to look into like 
bridging these two worlds, right? I think when we learn about homeopathy, one of the biggest arguments is that how can something have effect if it has no discernible molecular remnant of the original, you know, yeah, plant homeopathy that, is so heavily diluted. You're not going to so find it, diluted. a phytochemical. Exactly. Past like a certain dilution, there's absolutely no molecule remnants in there. But homeopathy, like the homeopathists, they never argue that there was. It is. So when people make that argument, they're like, well, we never said it was. But how do these medicines then work? They work, in my eyes, on this fascia, on this extracellular matrix, and it's allowing the body to say, hey, what are the proper steps that we need to self-correct instead of building this idea that we need to target the liver? It's like, how about we actually just clean up the matrix, allow information to not be, or allow the body to not be suppressed anymore, and then we can start this innate healing phase for that client. So we don't have to do as much work. I mean, it's pretty incredible. Mm. Like you said, when you're sick, quote unquote, on a physical level with something like an acute illness, you're sick wherever that illness lies and you need to dose it heavily there. Yeah. But because we're now sick more on a spirit level mm -hmm. and that's where the fascia interplays. I, I believe so. I mean, when we talk about the fascia, there's um, a couple studies and I can link them to you if you want to give sure. them in the show notes for people. But there's um, back Gosh, years ago, the first one that came out was on something called the primovascular system. Mm -hmm. So the primo, have you heard about this? My lymphatic therapist slash craniosacral slash like intuitive healer. Julie I already Tracy. love her. She sounds great. She's been on the podcast. <laughs> I'll link her episode. She talks about like talking to your body and when she's doing lymphatic, um, not even lymphatic drainage, but she's just giving you lymphatic support. She like moves in this figure eight motion so that she can act on the primovascular system. Yeah, yeah. So the primovascular system is the best thought anatomical structure that we can see. Uh, we actually can't see it through even like MRIs. We have to do a special imaging through like uh, fluorescent te uh, technology, but it's this it's this small system within the body. It's like its own circulatory system that's separate from our lymph and separate, separate from our circulatory system. And when you map out this primovascular system, they have actually been able to find the points that Chinese traditional acupuncture there, you know, books have mapped out you know, 2000 plus years ago. Wow. So we see that there is some type of anatomical structure for this vast communication in the body. Now, because I do a lot of work with bioenergetic testing and more of this like, I the word quantum is, there's so much energy around that, but <laughs> more like a, a quantum dynamic of healing. When we look at information transfer across this uh, primovascular system, like I think this is what we're interacting with is what TCM calls the meridian system. And these infinitesimal types of dose, whether it's homeopathy, whether it is um, flower essences or just small dosed herbs, it is first communicating with the interjunction of this primovascular system and the fascia, which is also, remember, hugged by structured water, hugged by the extracellular matrix. And all of that together in my eyes is creating some type of like huge communication system that then informs everything else. Mm -hmm. You know, we always forget that matter is so easy to identify, right? You and I are taking this matter form. We're literally energy slowed down mm -hmm. to be able to feel and sense. But matter and energy are it's a transient equation, right? E equals MC squared. We hear it all the time, but people don't actually understand that it's interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And so everything that we see in real life, it's building blocks. It's essential building blocks were first energy that we couldn't perceive yeah. before it was put into form. And so if we are just addressing what we can see, we're really missing out on this whole aspect of what's governing us, mm -hmm. right? There is um, there's really no disconnection mm -hmm. between how our bodies are interacting at the energetic level and how our physiology is performing. 
but we're so over here in the world of matter that we've just totally disregarded all of this to being some type of pseudoscience subtle crap. I almost think of a microwave. Like just because you can't see the microwaves doesn't mean that the matter inside the microwave isn't being changed and getting hot. You can feel that it's getting hot. Yeah. I mean, and we also, we, we have iPhones, we have I, you know, Ma we have Mac computers. We can literally pin something from our phone to our computer and we don't even think about that, that energy change, going right? in there, that, yeah, the airdrop, right? It, yeah, airdrop. Yeah. And then we talk about all of these type of electromagnetic frequencies. Like frequencies have effect on biology because at first we're energetic. Mm -hmm. And this is where there's really this breach in science of, you know, we need to bring biology and physics together so we can actually start having meaningful conversations about how these worlds intersect because there's people are arguing, well, when things are dense, quantum, you know, quantum rules don't apply anymore. But at the end of the day, we're still heavily affected by frequencies all around us at all times. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. people li literally have EMF sickness these yeah. days. So... Does this extracellular matrix and our fascia need to be supported in some way? I would say 100%. Does everyone need support here? I would say 100%. How would you know that you need support here? Just because we live in the world that we do, just because of everything that we've talked about here with the way that we are so fractured as a society, we're holding on to so much in that system. We've also been, for lack of better words, gifted things down the line, right? Mm -hmm. Transgenerationally. And we hold all of that potential in our extracellular matrix. There's a memory there. If we don't alter that memory, if we don't reprogram that ground matrix, mm -hmm. then we're always going to be sort of in this cyclical phase of just not really feeling well. So releasing or reprogramming the fascia is how we can get to sort of that intergenerational trauma that we talk about and that emotional or energetic root of illness in the body. It's through this fascia. Through the fascia, extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm. Com yeah, communion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I've seen you talk about some herbs on your Instagram for the extracellular matrix. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned marshmallow root and you've mentioned go-to cola. Mm -hmm. Can you share why these two plants interact with the system and what they do? So when we think about these, well, when we think about the fascia, it is once again covered in this gel-like structured water substance. And it's also in that substance, there's lots of like glycoproteins, right? Mm -hmm. It's really like when you get down to the fundamental level, like what, what is the viscosity of that? Now with these herbs, like Marshmallow root. Marshmallow root is my favorite one to work with. Mm -hmm. It's also really great for people who have mast cell interactions, which are highly tied to extracellular matrix imbalances. That's me right now. <laughs> okay. I'm so having a severe mast cell issue. And my my girl, Michelle Shapiro, shout out, has been telling me to take marshmallow root yeah. all day. Yeah. So funny that you're saying that. Yeah. Marshmallow root is great here. And it's because of those glycoprotein. You know, if, when you make a cold or a cooler water infusion of marshmallow root, what does it feel like? I mean, it's like gel. It's like gel. Uh-huh. Yeah. You could like literally gel your hair back with it, right? Yeah. It's like, it's such a beautiful consistency. When you intake that, it just like, it it adds this like beautiful, I don't know if this is the word liquidity, right? It like adds, it adds, um, it adds to the tensility support of your fascia. It mm -hmm. adds to the support of the conductivity within the fascia and extracellular matrix because these glycoproteins, there's like a charge when yeah. you take something like a gel-like matrix like that, right? There's a charge that can move through that. It holds electrical potential. Mm -hmm. So when we, you could eat okra, you could eat nopales cactus, you mm -hmm. know, like anything that is very gel-like. Chia seeds? Chia seeds. So that's why I've been, chia seeds. So I've been yes. downing my chia seeds. Yes. So Back to that idea of structured water, water, when it comes in contact with a hydrophilic surface, a, a water loving surface, when you put chia seeds in water, what happens, right? They, they gel up, they puff up. Um, it's creating that structured water. Mm. When you intake that, it's adding your, it's adding information or it's, it's adding, <clears throat> when you take that, it's adding coherent information back into your body so that you can now communicate at a better capacity. And you no longer have as suppressed a physiology. 
hopefully down the line as you continue to work with those things. Yes, because we want to add coherence back into the body. This is where there is a fracture in even the functional medicine medicine uh, Mm -hmm. system. We are continuing to add information, but not add coherence. If there's no coherence, there's just chaos. Mm. And this is why more, 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 it adds to the chaos, taking away Allow, allows for the body to re-regulate, but also we can nourish coherence with nur- when we when we actually take in things that have that structured water medium because that is a conductor. So when we take in gel like gel like substances, uh-huh. yes, chia, marshmallow, glycoprotein rich, jelly like yep. substances, yes. We're increasing the connection and the coherence within our bodies. Mm-hmm. We're allowing conductive information to be your body. Like when we're severely dehydrated, mm-hmm. a lot of people are drinking, chronically drinking reverse osmosis or distilled water. I don't care how much people are remineralizing. I see it all the time. It's corrosive to the body. It's leaching minerals. It's I see it all the time. Your tissues, it, how if they're so inter intermingled with water, if you're dehydrated, what's going to happen with coherent communication? Mm. It can't happen. Mm-hmm. It can't happen. So we talk about being mostly water. We talk about needing to stay hydrated, but it's even further than that. We need coherent hydration. We need to be able to put water in our bodies that actually can hold capacity for transferring signals across. Mm. So that's one thing that we are doing. That's why homeopathy and flower essences, like they're, they're, they should be made with structured mediums, structured oh. water, so that that information can then dissolve into your own fascial structure water and be able to communicate at a bigger level. You mentioned the marshmallow root piece for mast cell activation syndrome, mast cell issues, histamine issues. I'm going to have a whole episode with Michelle on um, MCAS and histamine and whatnot because a oh, lot of be folks in yeah. my community are struggling with that. I didn't know I was struggling with it until Michelle was like, hello, you have every symptom in the book. Um, and so what she's been teaching me is that mast cell activation syndrome and histamine issues are very much connected to hypermobility mm-hmm. and connective tissue disorders. Back to the fascia. So, and she's been telling me that connective tissue is more, it, it is fascia, of course, but it's also our gut lining. It's also our bones. I mean, it's also our blood and lymph. Our blood, our lymph. This and all our, is, comes out of the mesoderm. Our ligaments. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So the mesoderm, so this middle layer of tissue mm-hmm. that's between the skin and essentially like and the internal organs and yeah. deeper. Yeah. So there's a lot more folks I think nowadays that have connective tissue disorders as well. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot more people with HEDS or just EDS period or issues of, with hypermobility. Is that a symptom of our fascia becoming more compromised generationally? And can we improve our connective, t- those of us who have hypermobility and weak connective tissue, which includes the gut lining and all the things, mm-hmm. can we improve that by improving the health of the extracellular matrix? Because I noticed that you even mentioned go to cola, which is a collagen builder, mm-hmm. and then the marshmallow root, which will soothe the gut. So it almost seems like all of these herbs that you're mentioning for the system are going to actually help to compensate for the connective tissue disorders that we're now seeing as more mm-hmm. common in our society. Mm-hmm. So in short, yes, we... When it comes to mast cell reaction syndrome, it's so if, if we bypass the extracellular matrix and the fascia, we aren't going to be able to address that problem long term because the reason, once again, that you're having that reaction is because your body is perceiving that it is in a state of hyper reactivity. Yes. What is it hyper reacting to? Some sticky, icky, polluted matrix. Huh. And you have to remember, we have, there's these integrin receptors that shoot out of our fascia and connect into the cell, into the nucleus and interact with our DNA. Every, it's kind of, I kind of think of them as these, like these feelers, right? Like they're picking up this information, sending it to the cell. And then your cell says, I'm not safe. Yes. 
Yes, mast cell activation syndrome, histamine overload is you just not feeling safe it's all the time. It's not feeling safe. So it's your nervous system being constantly activated, yes. which is also then activating your immune system, yes. which is then causing your mast cells to degranulate and causing yes. this overload of histamine. Yes. But the problem is that even some beautiful fascial workers, they understand this, but they address the fascia only mm -hmm. without clearing up the extracellular matrix. So you can also see an increase in symptomology because, okay, great, you're you're supporting conductivity, but yeah. there's still this soup of muck, mm -hmm. you know? So the body is going to be like communicating this information at a faster pace now. Yeah. So that can create a lot of symptomology and a lot of discomfort, um, which is why when people get fascial maneuvers or even cranial sacral therapy or things that work on our fascia, mm -hmm. they can have histamine reactions at a deeper capacity, even just gentle massage. Yeah. Yeah. Michelle was telling me that even with massage, when you're hypermobile, you're just not supposed to essentially be moved like that yeah. until your body can support and clear things out and clear yeah. the histamine because you can have a worse reaction. And I was like, oh, no, I'm going to get a lymphatic massage. And I went to go get this like three hour lymphatic drainage thing. And that night I was so anxious, had so much of a histamine response. I was like sitting there in bed like, do I have melanoma? Like I was literally yeah. Googling <laughs> oh. insane things. And Michelle was like, I told you, told you we we're gonna have a response. So now this is making so much sense. So now my question is, how do we clear out the gunk in the extracellular matrix? Mm, this is a really big question. And personally, I find homeopathy to be the one thing, the one thing that my mast cell clients finally find that gets them through that. Because it, they've most of the time when people are coming to me, they've already exhausted everything. They're like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try this bioenergetic, like woo wow, like whatever this is. Mm -hmm. And we get them on homeopathics that target the extracellular matrix and all of a sudden decompression happens, mm -hmm. right? Their system starts to feel safe in that ocean. Now the cells can say, oh, I'm no longer swimming in pollution. I don't have to fight for myself anymore. That doesn't happen, you know, people get really, they're like, I want that to happen right away. Let me just take a homeopathic for that. It, it's it's time, yeah. right? Because it, it took us time to get to that place. Mm -hmm. But it is, homeopathy is incredible here. What I'm hearing from you too is when you're saying, oh, my cells are no longer swimming in pollution, I'm safe. Do you mean that pollution could be anything from heavy metals to emotional to toxins? Emotions. Mm -hmm. So that fear, like when we were mm -hmm. a child and we were scared of our fathers, that's what our cells are swimming in. And until we correct that energetic imprint that's mm -hmm. left in the fascia through bioenergetic medicine, through these things that act on the fascia energetically, because yeah. that's the language of the fascia and the, and the connective tissue, the extracellular matrix, can we actually clear those more subtle frequencies and energies that get stored there? Addressing the subtle in our bodies is the way that we're going to be able to address the physical, period. Mm. Mm. The more that we try to take these people with complex conditions and try to address through functional perspectives all of the organ systems or, you know, just try to kind of segregate healing in the body, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. Yeah. It's like, oh, we need to treat your SIBO. So we're going to give you all of these antimicrobials and yada, yada, at this mm -hmm. one segmented mm -hmm. part. But then we also need to address this. And there's also this, whereas you're kind of starting at the greatest well. The ground level. Yes. You know, there's um, one of the things that I like to say is that healing, you know, we look at the cell up, right? When we're taking a biology class, you learn about, okay, there's, we have the atom, right? And then that builds the molecules and then that goes up to eventually, you know, tissues and organ systems and all of this. But really even that atom, what is it governed by? The subatomic world. So why don't we include that first? Why isn't it the energy up? Hmm. Why do we start at the cell? And this is, once again, a divide between physics and biology because we haven't yet, I mean, there's Nobel Prize winning research out on how quantum physics, the world of the subatomic, govern things like photosynthesis, govern things like aviation in, you know, um, in, in birds. But yet, for some reason, there is such a fight about how do those phenomenons actually work inside of us, in our biological system as humans. Because we're talking about relationship, true relationship being so healing for humans and the ultimate answer, would it be fair to say or to hypothesize that if someone has a history of fear in close relationships due to a trauma that happened as a child, 
they could either clear that fear on this level of physics through uh, an energetic medicine like homeopathy that helps to slowly work on that fear that's stored in the fascia. Mm -hmm. And or they could also clear that fear through eventually having true relationship with someone or multiple people who have a secure attachment style who can re- wire that matrix to believe oh. I am safe in relationship and mm -hmm. I am okay mm -hmm. and I'm and I'm not fearful anymore. So you could kind of go either way. You could go either way. I mean, okay. you know, at the end of the day, exposure therapy is so incredibly powerful for healing any type of trauma, right? Yeah. Any type of experience. Exposing yourself to being vulnerable with people who you have learned to trust is yes. going to program rewire program like neural programs your amygdala to feel safe and at the end of the day whatever we think and we feel like we said in psychoneuroimmunology right that's going to change the way that the rest of your body is um is directing mm -hmm. things you know so yeah that's we're talking about this world of, of vibrational medicine yes but at the end of the day like we still need to instill a communication between humans. You know, yes. when I say bioenergetics, it's the energy between biology. So that's, that's what I mean. It's like it's like humans also yes. have a medicine for us. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've been learning so much this trip. And I I was writing about um the other day I was writing about how essentially like people are like herbs, right? Each person. <laughs> I love like categorizing people as plants. <laughs> yeah. And it's such a thing, but like, yeah. okay, so as many plants as there are in the world, which there's maybe an infinite amount. I don't oh know. My gosh, we don't really even know infinite. how many. Yeah. We have no idea. But so let's say there's all these different folks in the world as well, all these different individual people. I think each one of them have a specific medicine for us because they each have a spirit. And I think that it's our true relationship with that person that unlocks our own medicine, right? Because what they're actually doing to us is by witnessing us, by seeing us really deeply through their vision, through their unique spirit and unique lens, they're imparting upon us that unique vision and consciousness and spirit and that that way that they see us. And thus they're giving us sort of a new quantum timeline in which to yeah. jump into. Yeah. And same as plants, like these, it's through plants being in true relationship with us and really witnessing us and imparting their wisdom, whether it's through dreams, whether it's through these pings or insights that we receive when we're working with a plant, that's how they impart their medicine. And it's, you can, again, go either way. I do yeah. think that people can heal through other people and through relationship, but at the same time, you don't have to choose just one because plants are people too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, we don't need all of this stuff that we're talking about. We don't need the homeopathy. We don't need flower essences. We don't even need plants to but heal. But they are friends that they are can friends. help us. They can be in like beautiful relationships that we can decide to have. But I'm so happy you brought this up because the connection, the energy that we can exchange between biology, whether it's plants or humans or our dogs, right? It's like that is the most healing thing that you're going to be able to to experience in this life. And if you don't have that, mm -hmm. nothing else is going to be able to really take hold. You know, when I'm supporting other practitioners, I think one of the biggest difficulties is that holding space for one another. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you use what modality you use, what type of energy medicine or energy healing that you do. If you don't know how to build a coherent relationship with someone, mm -hmm you're not going to be able to walk them from one place to the next. Because I don't even know, <laughs> I've joked about this. I study, you know, all, all these things that we've talked about, but I don't even know at the end of the day if that's what's really doing it for people. I think it's the capacity that I hold. And I really emphasize all practitioners, like being, being a space holder mm -hmm. is first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And if you can't connect witness and move someone through what they're going through and help them recognize and make shifts within themselves, that's the alchemy that's missing for most healthcare Holding the systems. vision for someone. Holding the vision for someone. I really think. Walking them through that, yeah. that mud. People heal us through their vision of us mm -hmm. and so do plants. Plants also heal yeah. us through their, their vision, their wisdom essentially. And, and what they're imparting upon us. I think most plants actually help us just simply by helping us see. 
That's so funny you said that. So <laughs> I know I didn't really answer this question before, but you had asked me like, what plants have really stood out to you? Yeah. Right. And I know you have a deep, deep relationship with, um, with oat straw and milky oats, mm -hmm. you know, um, I literally last night, I haven't talked about oat straw and milky oats, especially together in so long. Last night I was recommending both of those to this girl. Literally last night, I can't, I can't like the plants are in the room with us right now. Okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. I love it. So my, I, I often say that the com combination of milky oats and oat straw together literally brought me back into relationship period with myself, but also with the people in my life that I needed to be in healthier relationship with. It built capacity in me through working with that plant. And I tell you, Olivia, I worked with that plant for over a year drinking 32 ounces a day. Now, I'm not saying everyone go ahead and do that, but I had mm -hmm. a very deep relationship with this plant. And the reason I decided to do that was I had this dream one day. I had this dream one day. And whether if I want to work with a plant like in a flower essence, it'll come through differently than if I need to actually work with a physical plant. Oh, I just have a guy who tells me. I, I love that. A I guy comes that. up and he says you should take elephant lustre or um, I remember when you shared that. Elephant lustre flower essence. I'm like, okay. Or he's like, mm, that family needs this plant. I'm like, okay. But yes, go ahead. <laughs> so whenever I need to like work with a physical plant, like I will be like, like the plant will touch my skin. You know? So like with milky oats, I was in this field because um I live in like the Central Valley, right? And I was in this field looking, there's so many fields there, and, and this grows everywhere. And the milky oat, as I was looking at it, it started raining on my face, like mm. this milky oat sap. And I just like had this, like, I was like, okay, I need to ingest this oh medicine. God. Like the, I need to actually ingest the full medicine, right? So I started working with with um, that in Intention. infusion form. Oh, infusion, infusion form. Infusion of milky oats, okay. Yeah, I did an infusion form. Um, very time intensive, especially when you work with that for long periods of time. But other plants like um, bog rosemary, for instance, was one that I dreamed about, but it was like I was distant from the plant. And the plant was like, it was like a rosemary bush, but in water, like in, in water. And I was like, well, that's not rosemary. And then like a week later, I was doing bioenergetic tests on myself and I saw the flower essence bog rosemary pop up. And I was like, this how crazy is that? That right? it came up in your fields through the, which yes. I want to talk about the bioenergetic testing for yeah. sure. It's like, we have to talk about what that is, but That's essentially you did thing. a scan on your body and yeah. you found that this flower essence was popping up on the scan as your body saying, I could use this right now. Yeah. And it connected the dream you had a week ago. I earlier. had never heard of Bob I've never Rosemary. heard of it ever. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what is this? But yeah, in my dream, I was like, rosemary and water. Like I couldn't make the connection mm -hmm. and I didn't feel connected to working with just rosemary. I was like, this is something else. I'm going to sit on it. If it needs to be, it'll come into my field again. And yeah, I started working with the flower essence then. I just keep, every time you say bioenergetic medicine, it's so funny because everything is bioenergetic everything. medicine. So when I did my first bioenergetic scan, um, motherwort, this herb that helps to give you courage and set boundaries and helps a racing heart came up yeah. on my scan, but also mantras, um, because the, the person who was testing me, I was like, can you click into mantras? I was very yeah. drawn towards it. And certain mantras came up as even higher than the motherwort plant. Mm -hmm. And this one mantra, I am a good person was my number one thing that I needed at that time. Cause I was going through a really difficult situation with someone mm -hmm. and I was blaming myself because in the past I had not I wasn't so proud of myself in relationship, but yeah. now I was really proud of myself. And I was like, wait, is it my fault? And I was like, no, I'm a good person. And so I found that just saying I am a good person could calm my heart just as much as taking the motherwort tincture. And it was sort of which route do I want to go on? Do I yeah. want to interact with this plant spirit to bring my heart rate down? Or do I want to say this mantra? Because both of them are going to have the same energetic impact on my cells in some way, because yes. we are all energy yes. and atoms at the end of the day and yes. nothing is real. <laughs> right? Like yeah. that's kind of the vibe. Basically. Yes. You know, it's, it, it, and that's one thing that I think makes bioenergetic testing so amazing is that we can perceive the physical body and the emotional body transposed together. And for some people, you know, that emotional body, those mantras, all of that is so, is screaming for so much more support than all this physical stuff. And we have to listen to that. Whatever's asking, mm -hmm. whatever's whatever's becoming more potent yes. through that testing, we want to follow that. It, I keep coming back to no machine is going to heal somebody. You know, it, it's it's the way that a tool is welded. Mm -hmm. 
you can have a tool, but if you don't know how to use it, then what good is it? So a lot of people will test and they'll just give tons and tons of supplements, but mm -hmm. it's that, is that really benefiting the client? Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, what's the right direction for them? Yeah. If it's those mantras, like fantastic, let's work on that. And then once we kind of work through that cloud, what else is going to come up, right? All this other physical stuff could find its own little balance, mm -hmm. right? Not having to do so much. So you were telling the story about the milky oats and the oat straw because I had said, I think most plants actually heal us by helping us see. Mm -hmm. Were you bringing that up because as you were working with milky oat and oat straw, it was actually just helping you to see where you needed to make changes in your life to help your adrenals or because it was physically helping your adrenals? Well, at that time I was going through a lot. And I was very, very, very depleted. So the medicine in and of itself, like acting on my adrenals and my nervous system, that triple restorative, right? Like it was very, it was restorative medicine at that capacity. But through being restored, I don't, I don't know that where the inter, I don't think they're not related, right? Through yes. that restoration and working so long with the spirit of that plant, I almost, mm. I was able to like then really build from that place. And I look at my life like before oat straw and milky oats and after. That's really how potent it was for me because everything, the capacity to serve other people, mm -hmm. to step into this bigger vision outside of myself and just being so self-absorbed, mm -hmm. right? I'm an only child. It's Same. like, it's very it's easy. Out here. Yeah. And it's not, it's not our fault sometimes because also it's like, I don't know how it was for you, but I could play by myself all day long and be like, oh, no one really needs to know what I'm doing. So it's very easy for me to just like fall off the map. Oh my God. And people My get friends hurt. are like, are you ever going to answer a text message? Right? No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's this weird thing. It's but just, I think isolation also becomes a coping mechanism easily for us because it's yeah. like our pattern. Like we're just yeah. used to doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. could be alone all day long and yeah. be like, everyone else is fine. They don't care and I'm good, you yeah. know? Um, but the capacity that built in me, not only as an adrenal reserve, which was very real, it's a remineralizing herb, um, lots of, you know, very beautiful vitamins, right? B vitamins in there as well. But the energy of that herb helped me move into this space where I finally could hold more capacity for others mm. and step into my bigger vision of what I wanted in my life. Because when I was kind of in that that place where I just didn't have that reserve. When you're depleted, it's about self-preservation. Yes. And that's where your consciousness gets stuck. Yes. On me. Because I'm not well. I don't have the reserves I need to give to myself or, or never mind to give to others. Mm -hmm. So it repleted you and replenished you enough to the point where you could look outside yourself yeah. and increase your consciousness as a human. Yes. Yes. And this is something I see all the time. Okay. This is something I see all the time. And I don't, you know, I don't know, I don't know what capacity you work with others. I know you've worked in clinic before, mm -hmm. right? But the more that some, I don't even care what, how they're using herbs or, or whatnot, but the more that you put the body into coherence, I love that word, right? Into some type of balance, the more that they're going to be able to access of themselves. And the more that you see people step up for the greater good of the world, for the greater good of our communities, there's really a connection here between seeing past ourselves as we work through medicine. And you I think really we're all- to restore someone yeah. so that they can go out and be medicine to others. Yeah. I guess what you said before of the fact that it was working on the physical is what helped the emotional and the energetic and the capacity and the looking outside of oneself and some of this ego dissolution almost. That makes sense with my dream about Angelica being bear medicine. I, I think you've maybe heard me talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and dream of seeing my parents yeah. in a swamp and the guy, the, the guy, the guy who talks to me in my dreams, bless that man, said families like that need bear medicine. And obviously Have you, you painted can, him? I know you're painting. I don't see his face. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I just like you feel just hear him, him or I'm feel like, him. I kind of just like think maybe he has like gray hair, but I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Fascinating. But I just can feel him. He's like skinny. I just feel, I don't know. Um, but he, yeah. So he said families like that need bear medicine. I looked it up. It could have been Angelica or Osha, but I had a clear mm -hmm. pull to Angelica. Mm -hmm. And, um, I guess as I, Angelica became my herb for codependency 
for healing codependency in my family because that's what the stickiness was in the swamp. That's yes. when I realized that dampness in Chinese medicine and gut overgrowth and all of these things are actually this symptom, in my opinion, energetically also of codependency. It's almost mm -hmm. like the two exist mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. As you work on the gut overgrowth, you help your codependency. And as you help your codependency, your gut gets healthier as a result. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a I wonder if there's a connection between like codependency and an underlying feeling of worry and like that spleen. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, no, exactly what it is. A thousand percent. It's this this lack of a sense of self because yeah. the spleen is also the sense of self, confidence yeah. within the world, boundaries, yeah. uh, all of these things. And so, and like worry, yeah. Um, but I, my like current theory of the world is that like all issues, like the only issue in relationship is codependency. Like really, like that's why ultimately like in the most extreme form someone would abuse another and control another because they there, need yeah. them right and and then in like the smallest form why someone would people please because then it's i'm still codependent on that person yeah you know, feeling that i can meet their need and me having mm. worth through that person it's and a big lesson for me is yeah. not witnessing the other for who they are it's just witnessing for what you can do for me yeah. and so on both ends of the spectrum the people pleaser and the one who's like using the people pleaser it's the same wound, right? So yeah. I think that is, so for me, it was like, okay, that was that the pattern in my family. My family had this deep and still has this deep codependent pattern and was stuck together and wasn't, we weren't going outside of ourselves to connect with others, right? At, growing up, I wasn't allowed to have people over. My parents really yeah. didn't have a lot of friends. They just fraternized with one another and kind of like became more and more isolated and sick as a result of that, I think. And so as I worked with Angelica myself, not only did my own dampness and codependency get better because I could suddenly see my codependent patterns and how I was being selfish or in self-preservation mode because of my lack of self-worth and mm -hmm. sense of self, but also probably made my gut a lot healthier microbiome wise, yeah. gut barrier wise, and thus helped to strengthen my boundaries that I was building as a recovering codependent. Yes. So it, I'm sure it worked both ways, cleaning the gunk out of the gut and the mind in terms of the dampness, mm -hmm. and then also relationships and boundaries in real life. Yeah. When you have that dampness, I mean, dampness is a damper, right? Yeah. It, it literally stops up yeah. energy. So it's so fascinating. I think that when I, I'm just making connection, like I, I see so much dampness with all of these SIBO issues and gut issues and IBS, yeah. um, spleen dampness. And I think that it's those people who are also in this, in this, in somewhat in this relationship where they're addicted to, they're addicted to ways that are, to behaviors that are actually reinforcing this pattern. I don't know how to mm -hmm. say it. it. It's it's almost like w there's no way for them to realize that the way that they are actually living and orienting in their life is contributing to this dampness. Well, that's in, dampness clouding the senses, right? Yes. It's like it's also yes. in the mind. And then that's where the herbs that disperse the dampness and clear our vision come in. And that's yeah. how I think so many herbs come to help us is by just helping us see our own behavior. Yes. Yeah. Meet ourselves. Yes. And that's, I think, what all of this is about. It's like, if, if you're, if you feel healthy and vital, like that's great. But at the end of the day, you're not going to feel fulfilled unless you meet yourself, meet the vision that you are trying to, you know, grow into. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I just wish that for everybody. Cause I think there's a lot of people who have never had that opportunity, sadly in their life. I think we'll get there. I think we'll get there through meeting our inner child. I think that's like the work of the future is like inner child work. Oh, yes. Um, but before I ask you about bioenergetic testing or biofeedback, because that's a big part of what you do and that's how we originally started even talking about this podcast episode, I just want to clarify when you're saying that you're working with these spirit doses of herbs, are you saying that you used to give people a normal strength tincture and be like, take a full dropper three times a day, whatever, or like a teaspoon three times a day, and then you move to having people take, let's say, just one drop. Mm -hmm. Why did you make that switch? And what are the differences that you're seeing? So I actually wasn't able to, I had been using spirit medicine in my own life, but I was a little bit hesitant in bringing that into practice because there was this idea where I was like, oh, people still need those really strong dosages. Going back to bioenergetic testing, 
one of the cool things is for practitioners, it shows us patterns, right? We're able to actually ask the body not only what it wants if it wants something, but how much of it does it want. And I find it so fascinating that in those people who are not dealing with chronic or um, acute issues, but more long systemic chronic issues, the body wanted less and less medicine. So I'm really just following what the body is telling me and it's what the body is telling me in mass. Wow. So I can't say I'm that genius. No, but I just, I keep going back to, yeah, like when something is more chronic, it is because the person is more overwhelmed and thus disconnected from themselves and thus their extracellular matrix is disrupted, the connectivity of that. And you need less to make a difference, A, and the body can only handle but so much. So that's why it's such a good fit. Yes. Until you restore that connectivity. So what is bioenergetic testing? (laughs) What, what a segue. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, so bioenergetic testing, you know, at the most fundamental level, we said that bioenergetics in that word, it's biology meeting energy and the intermingling of those two. Now, every single thing in our body has a vibratory signature pattern, right? We as humans have our own unique energetic fingerprint. And it's a fingerprint that is distinct because we have our own pathologies. We have our own emotional milieus. And so bioenergetic testing is looking at that individual fingerprint. And it's not only looking at the fingerprint, it's looking at with all of what is creating that individual fingerprint, what is the thing that actually needs to be teased out to make substantial change. And once again, using that word, add more coherence back into the body. Because at the end of the day, bioenergetic testing is just a modality of bioenergetics. Bioenergetics is like this huge umbrella. This could be Reiki therapy. This could mm-hmm. be anything that's that's moving energy. But we're interested in reading energy and we get it in the form of words, which is really interesting. Um, what is the nature of the test just to ground people and like what this yes. looks like? So there's a lot of different types of equipment that people use. The type of system that I use, it has these rods, right? You essentially are like a grounding rod in your body. Through the interaction of negative poles and positive poles, what's happening is this system is sending you current. And that current is looking for a coherent match to something that's going on or you are experiencing in your body. Say, for instance, somebody does come to me and they have a strep infection, just because we've talked about strep. Strep has a pathogen frequency. Mm -hmm. That frequency can be shuffled through you. And if you match with it, it will populate. This is not diagnostic, right? We're talking in energetic terms Mm -hmm. here, but that almost doesn't matter because we're all, at the end of the day, everything goes back to this energetic milieu that precedes matter and form. So we're really wanting to work with that memory of the body because sometimes when pathology shows up, it's not that the person is actually dealing with something. It's kind of like a memory of it sometimes too. Like the body is still dampened by the experience of what it had gone through. But even emotions have a certain frequency. So we're looking at the whole person Mm -hmm. and getting that fingerprint. So when they're testing with you, are they in person holding the rods? So I do distance testing with biological samples. Mm -hmm. Some people do it through voice and I'm like, no, I want, I want biological samples. Some people do like the cradle. There's like a, um, the hand cradle, a hand cradle device Mm -hmm. through Zyto and you can plug it into a a computer and it can be read that way. Yes. But your way is not Zyto. No, no. I use the Quest 4 machine and there's a lot of, I mean, and there's a lot of practitioners out there using Quest 4. It's a really great system. I'm not saying any other system isn't great. Yeah. just the one that I personally really enjoy. Yeah. And I think it's because of the – it's a little bit more in-depth than what I've experienced with other types of machines. So one of the things is that, you know, we get information – that is causal, what we call causal chain information. And that's kind of where the body needs to start. And this is really important because most of the people coming to see me have been through A, B, and C, and none of that's worked. They've got all the functional labs. They say, okay, I have all these diagnoses. I mean, I work with chronic Lyme cases. Mm -hmm. I work with mold cases. I work with Epstein-Barr virus cases, right? It's like they have all this data, but nobody has actually been able to get them from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. When we're addressing the energy, though, we're usually not even actually addressing those labs anymore. Yeah. It's what's proceeding and making the Milu more uh, susceptible to those types of 
pathologies. So you're testing samples of like their hair. Hair, urine, nail, and saliva. Okay. Because that's going to carry their energetic frequency. And when you are testing those samples, what does it look like on your end? Like what pops up? Is it a computer program and it just lists out? So it's, it's going to, depending on how like Every, every practitioner can sort of populate their system in a different way. I do it in a way where the first information that I'm looking at is causal on the physical body side. Mm-hmm. Uh, physical body, I say that, but there could be emotional things tied into that as well. And then we do have like a separate emotional terrain body scan. Mm-hmm. Now, when I look at that information though, yeah, it's going to come up in words and language, but we can only perceive so much through words. That's why we kind of have to feel into things a little bit when it says, this is why I think that when we're using bioenergetics, we're interacting with an energetic system. So if the liver comes up, is it really the physical liver or is it some, can we connect that to some type of repressed anger that we're seeing on the emotional scan, right? We have to be able to, to kind of just think in, uh, within the energetic architecture to really be able to read these scans. And is that where you doing a life mapping of the client comes in because you can ask them when these symptoms started and trace it back to a time when perhaps they had unresolved anger or something Mm -hmm. happened to them where they got, okay. Yeah. Like I had a client the other day that I saw and the first thing on her scan was, or on her intake form on her life map was, okay, at the age five to seven, my parents went through a really hard divorce. I was in a courtroom a lot. And what happened? That's when her chronic gut issues happened. And then throughout that time, it just got worse and worse and worse. Dysbiosis, you know, led to Crohn's disease. And it's like, okay, but now we see this emotional root. Mm Mm-hmm. We can try to address all that symptomology a little bit and get you to a place where you have just some quality of life, Yeah. but we have to go back to that. We have to retrace that. So what came up on her scan? Oh, well, it was so, so when we have the emotional scan, it's really interesting. There was definitely flower essences for feeling unloved, feelings of being um, kind of like pushed to the side between when her, she, she connected that to when her parents were arguing and she would kind of like hide and they wouldn't they would kind of like ignore her because they were stuck in their own arguments. Mm -hmm. But also um, it was one of the questions I ask people when they haven't been seen or perceived in their family life, one of the things that will happen is that they'll actually get addicted to being sick because it's the one thing that sh- that their par- their parents will actually stop and say, oh, we have to take care of you. So there was this really, really strong emotional signature for her that she connected with of actually using illness as a vehicle for attention. Mm. And that's really hard for people to come face to face with because I mean, we don't consciously want to like be sick. None of, none of us want to feel like that. But if that's the only mechanism that we've actually received love through, mm-hmm. I mean, it's powerful, you know? I mean, on a on another level, that happens all the time with our bodies, right? Sometimes the only way that our bodies will be seen is if they give us symptoms. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's like... I mean, it's a, like it's, it's an a natural creation. mechanism almost. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. it's not necessarily shameful. It's just natural. It's like, yeah. makes but sense. But when we create like this gnosis around it, right, where this means love and affection and mm-hmm. hugs from mom and, you know, hugs from dad. And that's when mom and dad come together to take care of you when mom and dad are usually so separate and arguing all the time. <sighs> Wow. It's like that was a sense of security for her starting very, very young. So with a client like that, are you going to look at what comes up for her physically on the scan? You're going to employ some physical mm-hmm. – um, is it going to be full strength tinctures? Is it going to be It depends on what dose? her body asks for. And this is the most amazing thing. The body will tell us if it wants to work with full on plant matter and constituents versus if it wants to work with this more kind of like vibrational remedy field, you know? So every single person is so different in what their body is actually asking for. And when we're running bioenergetic scans, it's never looking at like it's looking at you at that time. Mm. And depending on what your body is ready to elucidate, like that's what we will see. But if we go back to that conversation of suppression, a lot of people that you test are suppressed. People who come to me on lots of medications, it's hard to test them. It is actually physically hard to test them. Wow. They will actually come up as if their body is in a corrective state because their body is so confused by all these medications that are chalking up the receptors in the communication. Huh. So it's a process that you go through. It's not a bioenergetics isn't a quick process. Healing is never quick. Yeah. Ever. I'm fine with that because the quick stuff doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't (laughs) work, but it is at the end of the day, it is bringing you back to that innate capacity within yourself, which is, I don't know. It's everything. 
Wow. How would her body tell you if it wanted full strength tinctures versus drop doses? Yeah. So I actually in my system have like a, a way to to do dosing right okay. now because I don't work in a prescriptive manner. Uh-huh. Um, we have to be very careful about that language. But essentially the body will say, hey, yes, I, I want this tincture in a very strong dilution or no, I do not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is unbelievable. The things Un- the body will tell us are crazy. Yeah, no, I am. I just hope you know you've blown my entire mind with this conversation and you just are a thousand times smarter than me. And I love being in a room with someone who's that much smarter than me. I'm humble. I think we're equally as smart, girl. No, we're just no, 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 no. This, you're in a quantum physics world right now. You're jumping into different timelines. It's, it's hard for me, I think, to be grounded in. Uh, yeah. You know, you know too much. What I am stepping into yes. has made it, has completely changed my world because I went from, well, I, I went from herbalist nutritionist yeah. to functional medicine practitioner to bioenergetic practitioner to deciding that I actually really didn't want to work with functional medicine much anymore. And like really rewriting this whole narrative for me has been the biggest ego death of my whole life. It really has. And it's really hard. And I love having a medium here to talk about it because most people, once again, don't understand just the basics of being an energetic vessel first. You say that and people automatically glaze their eyes. And I always tell people until you experience it, I know you have experienced bioenergetic testing in some capacity. Mm -hmm. Until you experience it, there's no way for you to actually understand it because when you're working with subtle sciences, you can't see it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like we can't we can't see what we're working with here, but we don't need to. And we need to be OK with like reframing that the subtle doesn't mean that it's unscientific. Yes. And also people, I'm sure, have experienced bioenergetic medicine by going on vacation and seeing how their digestion changes mm-hmm. when they're in a happy environment and the sun is out and they have more coherence. Yes. In their body. And guess what? When we're in the sunshine more, we're getting We're literally getting infrared information, frequency from the sun that's penetrating our tissues, informing our biology. We think of frequency medicine as so out there, but Mm -hmm. even the fact that we, that sun communicates through our eyes, a frequency communicates through our eyes, through a part in our brain, our suprachiasmatic nucleus, which informs circadian biology of how every single thing in the body is supposed to be working and at what time. That right there is a frequency input. Mm -hmm. The sun is communicating with us. And when Mm -hmm. we don't have the communication from the sun, our circadian rhythm and thus our sleep and our hormones are totally off. So why would we think that our cells not having happy communication with each other and being dehydrated and having a compromised extracellular matrix wouldn't create Mm -hmm. a lack of communication and coherence and health within the body? Yeah. And even deeper than that, the sun, that infrared sun, when it penetrates our skin, if anyone, you know, we've talked about structured water a lot. Gerald Pollack did amazing studies on structured water, and he showed that infrared light actually induces water to be structured. So the more that we have infrared light coming into our bodies, the more we're actually able to je- self-generate structured water, which then supports the fascia, supports con- conductivity. And this, you know, you see hmm. so many people um, getting into you know, more of these like quantum uh, sun protocols and stuff. It's yes. it's really popular, but, and I'm, I'm happy it is because sunshine is one of the ber- first frequency supportive medicines that we ever interacted with as a species. And it's deeply ingrained in our, you know, DNA to use it for our health yeah. and yeah. conductivity. Yeah. Yeah. So can I put my loom box on like up against my water <laughs> and structure it? So or is it so like your, your water needs a lot of people are using these frequency structuring devices in their water, which I don't I don't have this. I don't want to I don't buy have, another device. I can't. I just I don't want you to. I'm saying like put some chia seeds in there, have a medium that is water loving, and then put, you know, that so frequency on it. Is you how need, we rebuild the structured water structured in Structured water can only form when it has a medium that is hydrophilic, water loving. Our cells, our tissues are high, are water loving, right? So it's that connection of hydrophilic surfaces water and infrared light that creates that. So if you just drink chia water and sit I out do in that the sun, every single day. You'll be good. Yeah. <laughs> 90% of your stuff I'm will like, go away. Just just chia water guys, that's all you need. 
I almost want to end by saying this. You're saying what every other worth their weight in gold functional practitioner that I know is also saying, which is that we're throwing everything we got at our clients. I'm tired of treating the SIBO. It's not actually working. I'm tired of treating this. It's not actually working. It's all the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Literally, that's what everyone I'm hearing who's a talented practitioner is saying that it goes back to the nervous system and retraining that and the the pain and the emotion that's all stored there in the body, not feeling safe and being in mm -hmm. fight or flight, which is also what you're saying in many mm -hmm. ways. And which also seems to be the field in which bioenergetic medicine works upon. Yeah. Yeah. The the nervous system is, I mean, when we come to fight or flight physiologies, like we're talking about that, that amygdala, right? That, that really primal part of our brain that's that is primed for survival and to keep us safe. Mm -hmm. But it, it's the connection between that part of our brain and our nervous system and how the the energetic part of the body is able to communicate with that. So I think it's it's kind of bi-directional. Mm -hmm. uh, the nervous system is literally everything. Yeah. <laughs> but it can stop but it's communication. Like what's affecting the but what's system, affecting what's the nervous it not system. Feel safe. And it goes back to that extracellular matrix. In my eyes, yes. All right. I'm going to need to take a bunch more classes on this extracellular matrix so that I you know, I know that it. you, um, you probably heard of, <clears throat> you probably heard of, um, Matthew Wood. Yeah. Oh my God. Obsessed. Yeah. He so he has, classes he has school. a book called, um, holistic medicine and the extracellular matrix. So from an herbalist perspective, that's a really good place to start. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I love this. I it's a really be... like, Anyone could read that probably who isn't an herbalist and be like, okay, I understand now. He yes. even talks about some vibrational remedies like homeopathy and that too, which is fascinating because for anyone who knows him, he doesn't really talk about that type of stuff yeah. too much, uh, but you could go so much farther. Okay. How can we learn more from you? Where do we learn more from you? Please tell us everything you got going on right now. <sighs> so I currently am not taking clients, <laughs> but I do run a clinic called Innate Body Academy, where I'm currently teaching a cohort of practitioners to step into this work, to use bioenergetic modalities, but also to integrate them with all the other things that they're using, right? It's never just energy. It's just let's let's overlay this onto everything else we're doing. Um, so that's something I'm really leaning into is that mentorship, which mm -hmm. I'll probably be doing that for the foreseeable future. And then ideally, if people really want to, you know, get connected and do some type of work like this with practitioners, we're going to have a directory for everyone who's gone through so that people can just get access to this because you don't need to be in person. Um, really, we can support anyone anywhere that they are. Yeah, it makes sense that you're doing this because we need more of you. It's like you, you <laughs> got to get more of this out there, you know, <laughs> more Laurens. I love this. No, oh, I, I think everyone is so... You know, one of the things I say is like I selfishly created this mentorship because... I need to be in community with practitioners too. We're, we we come back to community. There, as a professional, I think everyone has their professional hat on, and you know, there's even some like side eye going on of like, what are they doing? What are they doing? Like, why don't we mesh minds mm -hmm. and talk about? Oh, you're a cranial sacral therapist. Let me hear about your ideas when you learn these concepts. Like, I'm teaching, but it's it really is a community, and um, we're just coming together to learn. Okay. So Innate Body Academy yes. is the name of your practitioner cohort yes. program. Uh, well, that is the name of the clinic. The, the clinic. Pro the, the cohort program is Embodied Intelligence Bioenergetic Apprenticeship. Okay. And your name is? Lauren Baca. On Instagram, you are? Plantifully Lauren. Okay. We're going to put all those links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, oh Olivia. <laughs> Great. <laughs>